Hello everyone, it's 5.32 a.m. July 24th, 2017, I guess. And I'm going to finish up They Were White and They Were Slaves uh, with these end points, uh, the conclusion uh, of numbered points. Uh, after this, actually, I'm going to go back uh, to reading the PDF that uh, I started before I went into this. I just thought uh, when I came across this that this was uh, such an important uh, piece of literature that it had to supersede uh, the one that I was reading. And I was at a point where I could stop because the, the, the former PDF was a compilation of a number of different authors. So no big deal. Uh, I'm also going to be at the same time showing that for one thing there are a number of prophecies concerning Israel and the number of promises that were made to Israel by Yahweh that haven't been fulfilled that will be fulfilled and furthermore there is the more I, I read the more I find out the more I understand that uh, history since the time that our Redeemer ascended or from the time that he gave his res revelation to John the history of the world in general has been so maligned and controlled it's it's not just a matter of uh, you know I think a lot of people have already caught on to a real problem with history starting at Columbus but it goes far 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 back beyond that Remember, the old adage is that the winner writes history. Well, in Rome's case, that has been true for a long time, but um, they're not going to stay the winner. Um, <clears throat> in Daniel 7, uh, during his vision, he looks and he says, and books were opened. Uh, we know that everything at some point is going to come out in the light. And I think there's a whole lot uh, that has been suppressed and that will eventually come out in the light. And ultimately, the God of the Bible, Yahweh, and His Son, His only begotten Son, will be glorified. So starting at point six, Abraham Lincoln's use of the Bible, which according to his law partner, he did not believe, to justify rights for Negro slaves, is another example of his masterful politician's distortion of fact. While it is true that Galatians 3.28 contains the famous passage about there being neither slave nor free in Christ Jesus, this statement is meant to have only a spiritual application. The passage also contains the statement that there is neither male nor female in Christ, but I rather doubt St. Paul intended to sanction transvestitism or homosexuality. In Ephesians 6 5, slaves are ordered to obey their masters. Quote, with fear and trembling as unto Christ. In considering the biblical stand on slavery, it is necessary to differentiate biblical laws concerning the enslavement of aliens and Israelites. The former could be permanent. The latter was to be temporary. Even though many who claimed to be Christian heirs of the Israelites acted otherwise. In America, those who enslaved blacks and disparaged the manual laborer 
generally did not derive their philosophy from biblical sources. However, the legacy falls in the camp of ancient Rome. See J. Drew Harrington, Classical Antiquity and the Pro-Slavery Augment from Slavery and Abolition, May 1989. Southern planters did justify the bondage of the Negro with biblical arguments, but this was usually a rejoinder to abolitionist attacks, rather than the main source of enslavement praxis. It is chiefly from the aristocratic notions of the Romans towards manual labor that the classic mindset of the modern slaver in the West evolved. These concepts differ considerably from the status of the manual laborer in the Bible. Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, toiled as a carpenter for most of his life. Point 7. Harriet Beecher Stowe was one of the great hypocrites of the 19th century, a pious fraud whose legacy of malignant hatred for her own kind has infected many other white man and woman to this day. During her triumphal 1853 tour to Britain in the wake of the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Stowe was the guest of the Duchess of Sutherland a woman of vast wealth who had an interest in the betterment of the Negro. The Sutherland wealth was based in part on one of the most criminal land grabs in British history. The Sutherlands had seized the ancient holdings of the traditional clans of Scotland and burned the Highland crofters or farmers off their lands resulting in pauperism and in many cases outright starvation of the Scottish women and children. From Henry C. Carey, The Slave Trade, Domestic and Foreign, pages 204-209, to and John Preble, The Highland Clearances, page 288-295. through At one point, the Sutherlands even hired armed guards to prevent famine-stricken Scottish Highlander rabble from catching fish in the Sutherland's well-stocked salmon and trout rivers. From Preble, page 293. When Harriet Beecher Stowe returned to America, she wrote a glowing account of the Sutherlands in her travel book, Sunny Memories, specifically praising them for their enlightened land policies in Scotland, which she described as, quote, an almost sublime instance of the benevolent employment of superior wealth and power in shortening the struggles of advancing civilization. From Cunliffe, page 18, and Preble, page 292, in response to Stowe's appalling whitewash of the crimes committed against the Scottish Highlanders, a London newspaper described Uncle Tom's Cabin as a, quote, downright imposture and, quote, ranting, canting nonsense from Cunliffe. Ibid. <clears throat> so now we're down to a glossary of terms, enticers, spirits, transported, all of that. Now, at this point in time, let's see. Yeah, because I'm, I'm just not getting into those definitions. Or the bibliography. The bibliography is just gigantic. But uh, when I was making part nine, I was really trying to get everything in. And then uh, the family had uh, kind of all woke up. So I wasn't able to get those last two points in. I'm only about nine minutes in. So, I think what I'm going to do is this video might be a slashy. It's a slashy video. So, the end of They Were White and They Were Slaves. And I think it's going to have to be slashy. An introduction to biblical and historical records of Israel's tribal trek to the West. By Richard N. Stewart. Because there's no way I'm going to throw out something that's eight minutes long. And I don't really feel like sitting here kind of running my mouth off <clears throat> ad nauseum just to try to fill in the space. Uh, 
after that eight or nine minutes of two points. I do want to um, say something that I, I thought I had generously repeated, but I think in some of the videos wherein I had repeated this again and again, that some just chose not to listen to some of those videos. Now, first of all, for any of you who have paid enough attention to hear me say that I have been investigating many of the claims of what is called Christian identity. I want to start out by saying that, first of all, I do not agree with all of the tenets of all of the sects and individuals associated with Christian identity. I don't agree with all of the tenets of any sect of Christianity. I agree with what truth I can find, and I agree with what things can be discovered by preponderance of evidence. So, before anybody goes and looks at, let's say, the definitions of Christian identity from, you know, the ADL, uh, or organizations like that, Southern Poverty Law Center, um, who routinely just call people who are Christian identity hate groups, which is the most ridiculous term uh, I've ever heard, because uh, everybody hates something. I don't care who you are. Everybody hates something. The question is, do you hate the right things? If you say that you are someone who has no hate for anything, you're a liar. So, that's just the stupidest thing in the world. Hate groups. I mean, you know, aren't groups formed, uh, like, let's say, um, hey, you know what? How about, uh, affirmative action? And, um... Uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, you know, weren't they f formed because they hated racism? Um, they hate minorities not getting jobs, things like that, um, just because they're not qualified. Everybody hates something. And our Heavenly Father hates things. Our Redeemer and our Messiah hates things. So the term hate group is redundantly absurd. Furthermore, um, when I, again, again, when I started out, I, I didn't even start out looking into this idea uh, about who the ten tribes of Israel were today. That that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't even a trek I went on. It was something that I had to start paying attention to because of enough of what I saw in the Bible that told me I need to find these things out. And I need to find out who we're talking about, because it is not a biblical or an accurate belief that somehow uh, Yahweh did away with the Northern Ten Tribes, only to have them dissolve and not keep future promises to them. That isn't so. That that could never be proved by Scripture. So, then it is important to know who they are. It is important to know what his overall message is to them. Because there are a number of prophecies that are still uh, directed towards them. Um, and this idea that a Gentile church 
is a replacement for Israel is not correct. I once believed that, and it is not correct. But as far as what I believe concerning who the message of the gospel went out to, that one is still up in the air, and I'm not saying one thing one way or another. I'm not saying anything concerning what I believe about that, because I'm still looking into it. I don't know. Anybody who just says they know, or it has to be this way, it has to be that way, you're working off of pure emotions and ignorance. I would suggest finding out, for sure, empirically, based on what the Bible has to say. For now, we're going to be considering um, this paper by Stewart, which compiles a lot of information by a number of authors who have dealt with this subject. And we're going to see uh, how well this fits with the expulsion and dispersion of the Ten Tribes of Israel. And also, uh, my voice feels a little strained today. So, if, uh, if it does sound kind of scratchy or irritating, what can I tell you? Alright, so an introduction to Biblical and Historical Records of Israel's Tribal Trek to the West by Richard N. Stewart. The New Testament epistle of James begins with the salutation, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. I must comment. Does no one find it interesting that he says the twelve tribes scattered abroad? Not simply the ten. You're going to find out why as this paper goes on. But remember this, remember this. When Israel and Judah were split between kingdoms, and in Judah resided uh, most of the tribe of Judah, and the tribe of Benjamin, and a good deal of the tribe of Levi, of course, because they would be in Jerusalem. But the tribe of Levi, Levi were uh, all around Israel and Judah. Anyways, when the king of Assyria came down and carried away uh, what Israelites were left in the, uh, the house of Israel, he also continued his trek into Judah and conquered most of the cities. He found his problems when he got to Jerusalem, because you'll remember from Hosea that Yahweh promised that he would save the house of Judah, but not by their own might or their own strength. It was by his. He was the one who killed all the Assyrians outside of Jerusalem. But a good deal of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin and Levi, gone. So just... That's something to keep in mind, okay? So, those who were scattered abroad were the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as per Matthew 10, 5 through 7, and Matthew 15, 24. They were lost in the sense of the Greek word apolumai, meaning put away in punishment. But their whereabouts was not unknown in the Lord's day. Remnants of the so called lost tribes were still living in the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles, which is ethnos, nations, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, in Matthew 4, 13-15, in Isaiah 9, 1, 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. In the final days of Jesus' ministry, he left his kinsmen, the remnants of the tribes in Galilee, to confront the Jews in the temple in Jerusalem. 
When the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to arrest him, Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while, and I am with you. Then I go unto him that sent me. You shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then, they, then said the Jews amongst themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? John seven thirty three through 35 The word here is ethnos, being used. It should be nations. <clears throat> Those who conspired against Jesus could not fathom his cryptic allusion to his forthcoming ascension. They could only assume that he must refer to his self-proclaimed mission. I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who for the most part were dispersed among the nations. The lost sheep of the house of Israel, to whom Jesus commanded his apostles to go, were represented by a remnant of the tribes who still remained in the promised land. However, the vast majority of the twelve tribes were, as James' epistle had addressed them, scattered abroad. They had long since become a great migration towards a, a new Canaan in the West, the reformation of Israel in the West is about to be fully realized in the dawn of the kingdom age so writes william norman saxon under the subtitle the stone kingdom as we have seen all signs indicate the kingdom of god is at hand for many centuries the ground has been prepared in anticipation of the second advent this time the royal heir to the throne of david will come as lord of lords and king of kings in his book the parables of the kingdom john morley briefly summarizes that preparation for the restoration of the kingdom it is interesting that immediately after the death and resurrection of our lord the christian church was established in britain by the apostles themselves wherever the lost tribe nation was to reappear we may be sure that there the church of christ would find its home and from that center would spread out to all the world in the first century the home of christianity was removed from jerusalem to britain and here it has ever since remained. God knew that the early Britons were part of his lost race, and that in this land the tribes of the house of Israel would regather and become a mighty nation. To this land the throne of David would come, and the kingdom be restored. The early British church became strong and full of zeal, and missionaries from these shores found their way to Scotland, to Ireland, to Europe, in the early centuries of the Christian era. By the time Augustine came at the end of the 6th century, Christianity was firmly established in the Isles. St. Augustine, not to be confused with the earlier St. Augustine, A.D. 354-430, through 430, Bishop of Hippo, author of The City of God, occupied a position of authority in the monastery of St. Andrew at Rome when Gregory I summoned him to lead a mission to England in 596 A.D. The apprehension of Augustine's followers caused him to return to Rome, but the Pope furnished him with letters of commendation and encouraged him to proceed. He landed at Thanet in Kent shortly after the death of the renowned Irish missionary statesman St. Columbia of Iona in 597 AD. Continuing the excerpt from the Parables of the Kingdom, John Morley writes, Augustine was met by bishops representing hundreds of British churches, and for a long time the efforts of Rome to influence and control the beliefs and forms of worship of these early churches were strongly resisted. The British church is 500 years older than the papacy, and true Catholicism belongs to Britain <coughs> rather than Rome. The Pope has now publicly admitted that this early British church did really exist, and that these records are true. I have to break in here, uh, because it's just so amazing to me how pop culture absolutely uh, tries to, and often succeeds in, uh, sculpting 
our views of history. Uh, what sticks out in my head more than anything is the movie uh, they made about 10 years ago, I think. Uh, I think it was called Arthur. <clears throat> and of course, it was supposed to be, uh, I don't know, I think it was supposed to be taking place, when was it? It would have been around the time that the uh, the Roman Empire was declining, so the first few centuries A.D. And, of course, they, they portrayed the natives of the Britons as these goofy savages. Um, with, of course, Rome being civilization. So, it just goes to show you how anything, anything that Hollywood puts out, anything they put on a big screen or on the boob tube is absolutely not to be trusted. In fact, I would commonly just whatever they put out, believe the opposite, I think would be pretty safe. As God's witnesses, British and American Bible societies have translated the word into every known language and dialect and have distributed these scriptures worldwide. Glastonbury on the island of Avalon, long regarded as the cradle of English Christianity, can only be explained in the context of the Arimathea mission, writes the Reverend Ansley F. Rash. Oh, one more thing before I get to what Rash wrote. This is something that I gotta say about a lot of people that, of course, are labeled as Christian identity. These people didn't start by calling themselves that. They were labeled it, just like Christians were labeled as Christians. One of the big problems <clears throat> I have encountered with uh, both Christian identity and a number of the branches of Worldwide Church of God um, that started with Herbert Armstrong and all that. This is kind of a chink in their armor. It certainly seems to me that what they do is take information that is good information, take facts that are good, strong facts, and they so oftentimes apply a rosy uh, point of view. To things that I can't because well I'm not trying to extract what I want to see I'm not trying to get history to tell the story I want told I'm not trying to make the Bible preach the things I want preached, and I'm certainly not trying to make current events go the way I would like them to. If I were, I certainly wouldn't be talking at length about the current and long-time plans of the extinction of the white Anglo-Saxon peoples. If I were trying to get current events to go my way, that certainly is not the current event I'd be seeing. So Rash's quote, Joseph of Arimathea is said by tradition to have been the younger brother of the father of the Virgin Mary. He was a man of great wealth and influence an important member of the Sanhedrin Council. Joseph controlled more than 50% of the tin trade of the British Isles. He was one of the few men who dared to speak in defense of Christ when he was brought before Annas and Caiaphas. As a result, he was not loved by his fellow legislators. Soon after the ascension of our Lord, a great persecution broke out in Jerusalem. Stephen was martyred. James was beheaded. Peter was imprisoned and the church was scattered abroad. Joseph was forced to leave Palestine, but he did not travel alone. With him went Mary and Martha and Lazarus, whom Christ had raised from the dead. They were set adrift in a boat without oars and eventually reached Marseille. 
Here the Bethany family remained to preach the gospel in the south of France. All right, I'm going to break in. This is my commentary. There actually <clears throat> are a number of sources that cite at least Martha in France. They they are not they these sources have nothing to do with some kind of identity bent or anything else. It's just different historical sources do put Martha at least in France at least for a time. All right, a deputation uh, a deputation of druids from Britain waited upon Joseph and asked him to bring the Christian message to their land. Joseph gladly consented and landed with them one morning on the Isle of Avalon. With his own hands, Joseph built a little church of mud and wattle, church building of mud and wattle, the first Christian church building in all the world outside of Jerusalem. Joseph labored for many years at Glastonbury, and when he died, he was buried near the little church building which he had made. That, very briefly, is an account of the Arimathea mission from this sceptered Isles by the Reverend Ansley F. Rash. Centuries before the coming of the saints to the sceptered isle, a promise of momentous importance was told by the Lord's prophet Nathan to King David. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. This could not refer to the promised land described in Genesis 15:18, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and in Genesis 17:8, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. Israel was already dwelling in the promised land, i.e. Canaan or Palestine, considering the implied promise of immunity from the scourge of invasions and the captives which the children of Israel had endured for centuries, the words of the prophet could only be fulfilled in another land far removed and at a future time. The remoteness of that time when the Lord's kingdom people would at last come to rest in a place of their own is indicated by the words of Moses in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. And if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will do, uh, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins, and I will scatter you among the heathen. It has been determined that a prophetic time is 360 years on the Hebrew calendar, seven times. 360 is 2,520 years. This, then, was the duration of Israel's exile. It ran concurrently with the time of the Gentiles, when the Babylonian succession of empires was given a charter for world dominion. The period of Israel's chastisement began in 703 to 689 BC when the divided kingdom fell to the Assyries, Assyrians in a series of military assaults and the people were taken into the land of the Medes southwest of the Caspian Sea. I found something on the web about a military assault and the people were t Yeah, see that's Siri listening in. Always listening in on my conversations. Can bet she's doing that to you too. Ah, sorry about that interruption. Thank you, Siri. I did want to say something though, uh, concerning a lot of this again, a lot of this information. Taking facts, I I love when people basically present facts. I would prefer if after presenting fact, uh, substantiated fact, that they would let us know that what they're following it with is an interpretation or an opinion. <clears throat> I'll give you my case in point. When this author had just said, it has been determined that a prophetic time is 360 years on the Hebrew calendar. Now, I spent an enormous, enormous amount of time considering Edan, 
Edan is, is the word used in Daniel. Uh, in the Aramaic, in Daniel 7, when he talks about time, times, and the dividing of the time, it's, it's Edan. Um, its Hebrew equivalent would be Zeman. The thing is that thus far in all the studying I've done on those words, I haven't found anything that has told me that that is uh, the equivalent of a day-year sort of calendar. I'm just saying that. I just haven't found the conclusive proof of that yet. Now, I'm not saying that... I'm not saying that our Father does not do that. He does. Uh, and he's illustrated that. You know, in Numbers 11 and Ezekiel, or no, uh, Numbers 14, Ezekiel 4, Daniel 9. But what I'm saying is this. If this uh, author is saying that, that it's an absolute concrete, we know, we know, that we know, that we know, that a time is 360 years, I'm trying to tell you that I don't know that yet. And I spent an extensive amount of time uh, looking into that and trying to figure that out. The times. It's just saying. Um, you know, me personally, I, I really try not to mix um, what is established fact and then mix in my opinion as if it were also established fact. I give my opinion a lot. But it just if you're if you're writing a paper where you're citing a lot of facts, it just seems to me that it would be just to your readers just to let them know that a certain amount of it is your opinion. I don't know. Because I'll tell you why. A lot of people just like Christ said, there are his sheep. And a lot of people are going to just trust someone who is in a position that oftentimes seems to uh, garner or demand trust. And anybody in a position like that, I think, has to be very responsible with the things that they say and noting that the things that they say are either opinion or are things that have been well substantiated. I just think that more of these people who are self-styled reverends and pastors and whatnot, uh, they need to spend a little more time, I think, letting their congregation know, or anyone who would be reading or listening to anything, know when they're getting to points of information that have to do with their personal opinion. I think that's important. So the period of Israel's chastisement began in 703 to 689 BC, when the kingdom fell to the Assyrians in a series of military assaults and the people were taken into the land of the Medes, southwest of the Caspian Sea. Here the northern kingdom of Israel and most of the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin were held captive for 120 years until the Babylonian Empire gained the ascendancy. Then the fall of Jerusalem in 604 through 3 BC provided a providential escape for the captives in Assyria. After the city fell and many inhabitants were taken to Babylon, the armies of Babylon attacked Nineveh the capital of Assyria. The empire fell before the power of Babylon, and during the turmoil of conflict, the gate was left ajar for the captive children of Israel to escape. In the west, Egyptian armies blocked the path to the Mediterranean. To the east lay the Persian and Parthian powers, but the road north lay open. The prophet Micah describes the breaking up for Israel's second exodus. The breakers come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate, and are gone out by it, and their king shall pass before them, and the Lord on the head of them. Which that would be Yahweh. I'm not a fan of this person continually using the uh, 
King James. <clears throat> I'm going to pick it up next time where this author starts with the prophet Esdras. Okay. Uh, given this was a real sort of topsy turvy video, since I didn't realize that there was such a small amount of material to be covered at the end of They Were White and They Were Slaves. Uh, and if I ever put out an eight or nine minute video, I would like it to be a, uh, something complete yet concise. And I don't think that will ever happen. I don't know if it's possible for me to run my mouth for less than 20 to 30 minutes at a time. I think that's just the way it works. Um, and in conclusion, even though I'm going to be finishing this paper. Now, I've said this a bunch of times, but I'm going to say it one more time in a different way. I am not backing up all of the opinions of these writers. I don't back up all of the opinions of Richard Kelly Hoskins. The people that I read or listen to, I am for the most part extracting all pertinent information I can from them, trying to develop a proper view of what Scripture says. And I do believe that even though it doesn't currently, one day, all things are going to come into the light and the historical record is going to bear witness of all prophecies Yahweh's made to his people will come to pass. It will show how they have come to pass. I absolutely do believe that <clears throat> the Roman Papal Empire has gone to great lengths to suppress history. Um, And you know something, the Kazarian or Edomite Jew factor is something that most historicists have not, I don't think, properly dealt with uh, and factored into the message. I also still currently am not of the opinion that the only individuals that are going to be called and salvation would find are white skinned or you know Israel people at this point in time I still hold to the fact that Yahweh frequently throughout history even in the Old Testament has brought repentance and salvation to multiple varied peoples look at Jonah at Nineveh. Look at how he uh, dealt with King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Now, just because he deals with any people or any king or anything like that, I, of course that does not necessarily mean because he is dealing with them or speaking to them or speaking to them through a prophet or anything else that they are uh, then numbered amongst the elect elect those who are set apart called by him but in the case of Nebuchadnezzar we see a very concerted effort by our father to convert him we're talking about uh, a very severe chastisement and a repentance on his part there are so many anomalies just through the Old Testament um, that are working against somebody who has a view that somehow only those who are Israelites are among the elect to be saved and have the eternal life in Yahshua the Anointed. Job, where did he come from? Not an Israelite not a Jacobite. 
And of course, <clears throat> there were those ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob before them. And this idea, um, I'm still, of, of course, I would think most of you would understand that I'm still, of course, rejecting uh, the seed line idea. Still, at this point, I see no evidence for such a thing. I also have my own personal experience of having close friendships with a number of people of not only um, specific races, but, you know, with mixing somewhere in their background or, or in their parents. And I have the various accounts in the New Testament. For instance, Ethiopian eunuch uh, stands out screaming at me. It is thus far my belief that it was from the start, it was to be that this nation of people were to be a very special possession of Yahweh. Uh, of course, Yahshua said he didn't come for anyone but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. At the same time, there's going to have to be a good close amount of study done um, to what happens afterwards. Paul. Who exactly was Paul sent to minister to? I know that Yahshua came for no one but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But, when we look forward in prophecy, we see that Yahweh had always intended, and if he has an intention, it's going to come to pass, for Israel to be this special possession of his, a nation whom he was going to deal with in a very special and specific way, a nation who was going to bring the, the good news of his kingdom um, and his laws, statutes, and judgments to all the nations of the world. That I do yet still believe. And I believe there is a difference in personal salvation and national salvation, as well as believing that there is yet still a difference between race mixing, which I don't see him ever being okay with in the Bible, and races being better or worse than one another. Because, of course, some people mix those two together, and they want to... I don't care if you're somebody who believes in, in black Israelitism, or Anglo-Israelitism, or, 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 you know, you're those, uh, those Kazarian gangsters that are occupying Palestine. They're, they're, in a way, I think, still yet, I believe... They are apples and oranges. I don't see our father being okay with the mixing of races. Obviously, he made all of the races and want them to remain as they are. And it seems apparent that that is true. But that does not... It, it would be a non sequitur to say that that also means that some races are better than others. Because we must consult the Bible and see how often Yahweh speaks of Israel in very uncomplimentary terms as a people. Very. So for those of you out there that are still interested in finding out what the truth <clears throat> of the message of the Bible is, what the truth of the message of accurate history is. Hang in there. That's the road I'm on. 
and I don't have a tendency to cover over uh, facts and truths that don't go along with my dogma because I don't have a dogma. When I find the truth and I know it to be true, I stick with it. If not, I am presenting information. I am oftentimes giving opinion. I'm oftentimes just meandering in my thoughts. And again, that's the reason that I started this channel, is because many people are on that same road, that same path. If, if you're somebody that's, that's got things all figured out by now, this is not the channel for you. I'm just sitting here communicating. So, do what you will with that. And until next time, I, I do pray that uh, whomever you are, you do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of the faith. And that you love the truth, because the truth will love you back. <laughs>